Samit Vartak joins us, uh, CIO and partner with Sage One Investment. I would have loved to have, you know, host him in a studio, but uh, just one of those days where we managed to collect, connect via the satellite. So, Samit, good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, let's pick it up from where we left last time. You were of the view that selectively value had emerged in mid and small cap stocks. And post our last interaction, the sell-off in NBFCs has intensified and mid cap stocks have fallen uh, slightly more. So what is your market call now? Are you respecting the fall or are you simply buying the fair? Hi, hi Nikunj. Uh, good morning. Um, so I think... Uh, See, the problem with the markets is that, you know, it, even if you feel that there is a fair value emerging, you know, if X is the fair value, you know, it can easily go, go down to point at X. And uh, that's where the, the trick is. The, the problem is you don't know uh, whether it's going to go to point eight X or whether it will stabilize at, uh, at X. And an investor who is a bottoms up investor, you know, I think his time is best spent on trying to understand the individual businesses, you know, the, the bottoms up uh, businesses and how they are doing. Um, if you are a good timer of market, it is a different kind of investment and, you know, you can, you don't even need to focus on uh, businesses. Uh, you know, I'll give you uh, just very quick uh, analysis of uh, the past th 38 years. You know, if you had invested 39 years ago in Sensex, your money would have multiplied 251 times in the last 39, time, uh, 39 years. But if you had missed out the best 1% days, I'm talking about just 1% days, your returns would have been zero. The other side of that coin is that if you had missed the one worst percentage days of the Sensex, your returns would have been 51,000 times. You know, so that's the downside or upside of timing the market. Problem is, I don't know any investor who is good at avoiding the worst days, but you should make sure that at least you don't avoid the best days in the market so that at least you, you know, make the 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 average uh, returns you know i i like your analogy that you should always stay on the course and you know we've been a big advocatory of sip and for the first time samit i'm sure you would like to applaud media here that media has done a great job of telling investors that you should not cancel your sip sat hazar crore has come in the month of october <laughs> absolutely i think uh, there are many investors, at least, uh, you know, uh, who are today focusing on advising appropriately to the clients. You know, uh, this time at least I have seen very little, uh, and especially the media, you know, has done a really good job. Uh, all the all the houses that um, not to scare the investors, you know, when they should be coming to the market at the right time. I mean, our experience has been that when we raised the funds uh, last time. Uh, in 2017 and we closed it in October uh, our f fund raise was much lower than we raised it this time during the worst of correction and uh, that shows the maturity of the investors uh, in the market and you know I can tell you for sure that this is a very different cycle than 2008 because at that time most of the investors were you know leveraged uh, completely they didn't have the liquidity to invest. You know, most of them were already in the market and they took the entire hit of the down, downtrend. I don't think that's the case today. There are many investors, even today, are sitting on a lot of cash and they're just waiting for probably more correction because, you know, that's the general sentiment that until the next election, you know, maybe in uh, April, May, we will not have a stable market and probably we'll get better, better opportunities. So definitely, I'd have to you know commend you for that. So that and Samit, uh, you know, just uh, taking up the kind of points that you brought across, and that's something that you've elaborated on as well as in your uh, notes, talking about how.
India's current valuations absolute stack up against the 17 years of history and how they can be deceiving or entice you and you know keep you out of the markets at the wrong time. Timing of course as you pointed out seems to be fairly crucial. So let's talk about the timing right now in the kind of setup that we're currently in. It's a volatile time, no doubt. I don't think anyone anticipated this kind of a correction in the markets. We've somewhat stabilized. There's lots of factors working for and against us. But at the current levels, what is it that you think investors should do at a time like this? Is it time to nibble in, steer clear? How do they look at the markets? See, again, you know, I'll take back uh, a little bit to the 2008 kind of an history. Uh, if you look at the mid cap and small cap indices, you know, they went down from January 8 to March 09 by about 70 to 75 percent. All right. Now, we don't know whether the January 08 level were appropriate or January 09 level were appropriate. Actually, I would say with confidence that neither January 08 levels were appropriate or the March 09 low levels were appropriate. But if you look at the ferocious jump after that, you know, from March 09 to June 09, just within less than three months, the small cap index was up almost two and a half times. The mid cap index again, you know, 2.25 times and the nifty itself was up by 1.8 times within three months. So it had recovered a lot of losses, you know, within a matter of three months. Now, a person who is sitting out, I'm not sure if we, because the initial phase of the start of the bull market is so ferocious that you find difficult to enter those stocks which you probably had available at 20 or 30 percent lower valuations and that's where you know the difficulty is from March 09 to within the one and a half years so I would say by November 2010 the small cap index was up four times so now question is, you know, do you let go of this? Because someone who sits out in cash, that's sort of inherent, you know, that, that he can't change his nature suddenly and start putting that money because he knew that this is the bottom of the market. You can never time the, the extremes because even in the peak, the markets can go well beyond X and even during the bottoms the market can go well below below x whenever it's around x i think you should be fully invested there is no point in micromanaging those last few percentages i'm pretty sure you know a 10 percent or 15 percent movement downward movement from today uh, it's a random movement you no one knows whether it will happen or would not and hence you know Okay, maybe in 2008 it went to 0.5x and from where it jumped up 4x. But if I believe it's at x today and if it's going to be 2x in say one and a half years or two years or three years, I should be fully invested. So if I'm looking at three years down the line, you know, the question for me is much more easier that from today's valuation, the probability of you making above average returns which are more than 15 percent annualized returns is much higher but if you ask me what's the case for the next three months or six months or even one year i really have no clue and i don't think anyone has any clue even so uh, summit uh, the market has given opportunities in the way uh, you know with the currency's weakness export oriented themes came to the fore uh, do you feel uh, like uh, you know uh, opportunities in IT, pharma or, or some of the other export oriented stocks uh, are even more pronounced at this juncture? I, I think you have to be selective. There are even before the rupee depreciation started, you know, a specialty chemical theme which I have been talking about for the past uh, I think few years has been doing well. You know, even when the rupee was at 60, uh, many of these companies have been doing well since 2010-11. And with this pronounced depreciation of rupee, I think uh, it would definitely help them further. But I think as an investor, you can't predict what's going to happen with the rupee levels. You have to pick businesses, assuming that rupee will go back to 60. 
you know and those are the businesses which do not depend on favorable macro conditions for them and if we focus on such export oriented businesses i think it's a structural story for them for the next many years you know it's there is structural change happening in china where their customers you know who were dependent on 70 or 80 percent of their supply from china in specialty chemicals they would want to make uh, sure that they have alternative sources and i don't think there is any better alternative source you know there is no other country which can replace the capacity that china has you know india probably is three to five percent of the market whereas china i would say even today is two-third of the market so we have a lot of room to to catch up so rather than focusing on you know the broader schemes which are already played out like an it or a or a pharma i would focus more on uh, the specialty chemical niche companies i would say focus on companies where they are the best in their individual chemistry you know so for example benzene you know who is the best player in that uh, you look at the fluorine chemistry who is the best in that you know toluene you know there are multiple uh, chemistries there are multiple processes and if you bet on the most efficient and the best player i think they have a long long way ahead of them you know for for a long structural growth where they should be able to compound their earnings at i would say at least 20 to 25% per year uh samit now we spoke about specialty chemicals we spoke about data as a theme uh but i want to take the conversation back to where you think the opportunity was great but the valuations were not that great uh you know for example an aisher a page some of these stocks have also corrected are you hunting in some of the classics uh because valuations are looking attractive because these were great businesses available at ridiculous prices so you know we markets were giving high p multiples to high growth businesses now the high p multiples have got contracted so is it time to go back to maybe some nbfc names or some consumer names yes you're right i think from the time we spoke last time many of these uh, high quality uh, company multiples have corrected but unfortunately the uh, the multiples for a good quality mid cap small caps have corrected even more than more than that so in terms of relative valuation i don't think uh, you know even today value has emerged in lot of top quality nbfcs or top quality consumer oriented companies so even today i mean if you look at the trailing multiple of a page you know it will be well upwards of 75 80 times you know you look at uh, avenue supermarket you know it is still upwards of 90 times in the long run it's very difficult for a page to be probably growing at more than 15 or 20% earnings uh, and from whatever angle you look at an 80 times multiple seems overstretched you know uh, so maybe some nbfcs which have really corrected a lot which are not complete lenders you know the, because i think for lenders the cycle has turned they had a long stretch of 8 9 years of favorable cycle you know aided by demonetization where huge cash came into the system and the banks had to deploy it so you know there was a huge cheap funding which was available to the nbfcs those kind of names or the spreads you know are are not going to be available going forward and at the same time the interest rate cycle has turned uh, so it's definitely not going to be a favorable environment for them so i would probably stay away from lenders other than maybe the top you know one or two players even there i don't think the value has emerged uh, but if you are focusing on um, asset managers or uh, you know where they are not completely dependent on the lending business again it's a very long term structural story for them and uh, those would definitely do do well over the next probably the next business cycle samit closing you know last question from me and then you know maybe avan and tanvir could have some follow up questions now the businesses which you typically write like right now uh, you know it's whether it's data dependent or it is in the optical fiber industry or specialty chemical some would argue that these are uh, b2b businesses and b2b businesses historically do not enjoy what would be called as extreme ends of pricing power 
uh, you know, they may get lucky, but ultimately the market demand, volatility, cyclicality, it always tends to cap B2B business. And markets don't give very extraordinary P multiples to B2B business. So how would you counter my points? No, you are exactly right and you got to be aware of uh, such investments when you do it. So, you know, when I am investing in uh, such businesses, uh, I don't have a time frame of Warren Buffett in my mind, you know, that I would invest forever. The dynamics of these businesses keep on changing. You have to be well, well aware of how the competition is, uh, you know, evolving, what kind of disruptions can, can come through. Um, I mean, if I was given a choice uh, of... Uh, investing in you know branded companies i would definitely go for those but unfortunately india do not have too many options we have very few options and there is too much demand for them so there is a huge supply demand mismatch for such businesses where and that's the reason they trade at i think at least twice the valuations of where you know they are available in the global markets um, you look at the us markets you know there are you will find the best of brands created in their best of financial services uh, companies getting created, best of IT services, uh, IT product companies getting uh, created. So there are multiple options, best of pharma companies. There are many better options of probably a B2C uh, businesses, which an American investor has, which is not the case right. in India. In India, the regulations keep on changing. Right. People don't really want to spend too much on brands. And that's where I don't have too many options. Unfortunately, uh, Samit, we don't have time to ask you more questions. Would have liked to extend that conversation. But thanks very much. And always nice to get a fresh and interesting perspective as well on the show. Good to have you with us.